So um, I will tell you the tale of a comet. Yes, it is a bad pun. So what is a comet? It's an icy body and comets have um, generally very large uh, orbital um, periods and they are very eccentric orbits. So uh, it's an icy body that spends most of its time far away from the sun, usually even farther than uh, the planet Neptune. Uh, we'll talk about more about the source of comets and where they spend most of their time next week. Um, but in general, it's an icy body. And when it does come close to the sun, that small icy nucleus, which tends to be only about one to 10 kilometers across, so around the size of most of the asteroids, that nucleus starts to vaporize and glow. So that um, vaporized part of the comet is called the coma, which can be up to about 10 to the five kilometers across. And that's about the size of Jupiter. So bizarrely, uh, a very small object can look extremely large because of the vaporized water that's coming off of this, its surface. So comets, as they vaporize, they, they uh, kind of chip off bits of dust and ice. And this forms a tail that trails behind the comet. Um, there's another tail called the ion tail that's made of ionized gas. So uh, both of these tails, the ion tail and the dust tail, point generally away from the sun. The ion tail points directly away from the sun. Um, and it's made of ionized gas. And the reason that it points directly away from the sun is because the solar wind actually carries some kind of built-in magnetic field. And that sweeps the ion tail, the, the charged gas particles in the ion tail directly away from the solar wind. Um, the dust tail is swept back um, by a different mechanism, which is actually the pressure of the sun's radiation. So it might seem weird, but uh, each uh, photon of light actually carries some uh, momentum with it, and that can each photon can actually press on things in space. Uh, so this uh, may seem like a bizarre concept, but if you've ever had one of those toys, like uh, they make these little kind of spinners um, that are they have like they look like little weather vanes, and they're white painted on one side, black painted on the other side. Um, I guess that's not really a radiation pressure effect, but the radiation that comes off of the bright side or of the dark side. Um, so it, you know, absorbs some heat from the temperature of the room. And then as it radiates uh, infrared light, heat light away from that dark side, then it actually pushes that vein. So this is, you know, a measurable effect that we can actually see even on earthly scales. Um, so it might seem weird that, you know, light is able to push the dust tail of the comet, but that's exactly what's happening. So uh, which one of these has the correct orientation? Um, in this, uh, it might be a little confusing. The gray one is supposed to be the ion tail, and the blue one is supposed to be the dust tail because it's like chunky in appearance. I'm seeing most votes for D and that's right. So um, only C and D have the ion tail pointing directly away from the sun. So we know that A and B can be crossed off of our list. And those dust tail, the dust tail uh, lags behind the ion tail a bit. Um, and depending on where it is in its orbit, sometimes the tail will appear to be in front of the comet. So um, the tail of the comet and the coma are the parts of the comet that we can see from the perspective of Earth. Um, I don't know if any of you had the chance to see Comet Neowise this summer. It was like a big thing. Um, I took some very bad pictures of it, uh, which I didn't put in my slideshow here. But um, in general, those comets, you know, they only come by once, once in a while. And so that's why it was so exciting to have Comet Neowise around this summer is because it, it, it's not every day that you get to see a comet uh, with your own eyes or through binoculars. So the reason that comets only come by every so often is because they tend to have very long periods. And so even a short period comet tends to have um, an orbital period on the order of about 100 years, which means that it's, it comes around in, you know, kind of human civilization type time scales. So a good example is the comet Swift-Tuttle. Um, and then a long period comet is, um, you know, might be seen not for a very long time. I guess this is still within the time scale of human civilization, um, but this was last seen in 1843. The Great Comet of 1843 won't be seen again for you know 600 to 800 years after it was last seen. 
And the reason that this is a range 600, 800 is because it's hard to get uh, a, a very good idea of those orbital periods when you can only observe them for a short amount of time, right? We, especially this great comet of 1843, um, it's not as if we were able to follow it for long with, uh, with modern telescopes or with deep space, uh, you know, spacecraft. And so there's only a, a, like a few months really of observing time that you have. So therefore it's hard to nail down the exact orbital period. Okay, so again, we can use Kepler's third law to find the semi-major axis of these comets. Um, and if we do that, then we find that comet Swift-Tuttle has a, a semi-major axis around 26 AU, while the Great Comet is somewhere between 71 and 86. And to give you some comparison for that, Pluto's orbit is about 40 AU from the sun. And so these comets can go even beyond the orbit of Pluto for some of those long period comets. Um, they're not circular orbits though. So they spend most of their time far from the sun and only a short time near the sun. Uh, they have very high eccentricities. Uh, so the semi-major axis is a good fraction of the uh, total um, width of their elliptical orbit. Okay, so um, we have sent some sample gathering missions to comets just like we have for uh, asteroids. And in general, since comets and asteroids are both kind of leftover materials from the solar system's formation, it's really interesting to look at their composition. And every time that we've gathered material from comets, there are new surprises. Um, I think I have listed these in reverse order of when they actually happened. Um, but the, you might have heard of Rosetta and Philae. That's the, the probe from the European Space Agency and its little lander. They landed on Comet 67P. Um, and what they found is that there's actually seasons on this comet. Um, and that kicks up dust and the comet gets its own little dust storm. Um, so pretty strange, unexpected, never observed before. Um, some of the other sample gathering missions from NASA found unexpected things too. So Stardust was one where they, uh, they had this sample of aerogel, which is this very absorbent, low density material. Um, and they, they basically put it out in space near Comet Wild 2 and just collected the dust that was coming off of the comet. And what they found is that the Comet Wild 2 contained minerals that could only form at extremely high temperatures, which is really weird because comets are icy objects. And we thought that they formed in the outer solar system from only icy materials at extremely low temperatures. So this suggests that maybe it's possible that some of those minerals formed closer to the sun and then later made it out toward where the comets formed. Uh, so that was a big surprise. And then um, the mission Deep Impact, um, threw a projectile at Comet Temple 1 to knock off some dust. And they found that it actually contained a substantial amount of organic material. And some of this might be responsible for bringing some of the you know, building blocks of life to Earth. So um, lots of reasons to continue to study comets because every time we find new information, it's not what we expected.